Welcome to Hart and Trocken. My name is Dirk Schieborn and in this video we talk about so-called indefinite integrals. An indefinite integral is a very simple idea. It is the inverted process of differentiation. So if we are given a function, we look for some other function such that our original function is the derivative of this other function. And these other functions are also called antiderivatives or primitives. So let's have a look what's that all about and let's go. The idea behind indefinite integrals is a question. And this question is the following. If I'm given a function f, is there another function, which we usually call capital F, such that f is the derivative of the function capital F? In the case of a specific example, this is the following question. If the derivative of an unknown function capital F is x squared, then what is the function capital F? Well, in this easy case, it's not hard to guess the solution by simply inverting the rules of differentiation, which we already know. In fact, it is easy to see that the solution is this. That means that capital F is the function one third over x to the third power. We can easily verify that that is true by simply differentiating the function capital F, which gives us x squared. Now, as always in mathematics, we want to be as complete as possible. So the question is, is this capital F the only solution? Or is there any other capital F which also works? Thinking about differentiation rules, it is easy to see that we can additionally add a constant to this function. Because when differentiating, that constant turns into a zero. But this insight, in turn, gives us a complete bunch of functions because c can be any real number. We call functions like these, which have a given function as their derivative, antiderivatives or primitives of the given function. In general, if we have a function capital F of x such that its derivative is f of x, we can build an entire family of such functions by adding an arbitrary constant c. We call this family of functions, capital X plus c, the indefinite integral of f of x, and use this notation. The symbol in front of f of x is called integral sign, the expression dx is called differential of x, and the function f of x is called the integrand. So let's get back to our initial idea of a question. If we see something like this, this is a question to us. Namely the question, for the function f of x, find all functions capital F of x, such that the derivative of these functions is f of x. Let us now see if we are able to solve these questions for certain well-known families of functions. We start with x to the power of a. The question is, find all functions capital F such that the derivative of capital F is x to the power of a. Now looking at the power rule of differentiation, it is easy to see that one solution to this is 1 over a plus 1 times x to the power of a plus 1. If this is not immediately clear to you, just verify it by differentiating this expression. By the power rule for differentiation, the exponent is reduced by 1, so the exponent a plus 1 turns into the desired exponent a. Additionally, the exponent a plus 1 is placed as a factor in front of the expression. But then this factor cancels out with 1 over a plus 1, and we receive the desired factor 1 in front of x to the power of a. So everything works out nicely. However, it is important to realize that we are not allowed to use the value a equals negative 1. 
because if we did use this value, we would have minus one plus one in the denominator, which would give the forbidden value of zero. However, that solution is not yet complete, because remember, we are supposed to find all functions whose derivative is x to the power of a. That means we have to add an arbitrary constant c. This rule, which gives us the antiderivative or the primitive of power functions x to the power of a, is an extremely important rule because it is an essential component of calculating more complex integrals. Now we want to look at the situation when a does equal negative 1. As we just said, that rule does not work in this case, so we have to look at this case separately. First we observe that x to the power of negative 1 is nothing else than 1 over x. So this is why we have to calculate the indefinite integral of the function 1 over x. To calculate this, we recall the rule of how to differentiate the natural logarithm function. The derivative of the natural logarithm function is indeed 1 over x. So we can say that the indefinite integral of 1 over x is ln x plus c. However, if we look at that closely, something is missing here. Because the thing is that ln x is only defined for positive x values. However, on the other hand, 1 over x is defined for all real values except for 0. So we would like to have an antiderivative of 1 over x also for the negative real axis. Let's understand that graphically. This is the function 1 over x. We want to find the antiderivative for 1 over x on the complete real axis except for 0. On the positive real axis we know that this antiderivative is ln of x. However, what is the antiderivative on the negative real axis? Because the function 1 over x is symmetrical with respect to the origin, the function value of a point on the negative real axis is negative to the function value of the respective reflection point on the positive real axis. Now, the missing antiderivative on the negative axis at some point on the negative axis should have the negative version of the slope which the function ln of x has for its mirror point on the positive real axis. Now, it's very simple to find a function on the negative real axis with this behavior of its slopes. Namely, it's just the reflection of ln x at the y-axis. Because if I now draw the tangent to this mirrored function at the mirrored point, we see that the slope of this tangent is exactly the negative version. Now, if we want to comprise these both function parts in one formula, that formula is ln of the absolute value of x. So, f of x equals ln of the absolute value of x is the antiderivative of 1 over x on the complete real axis except for 0. Next, we ask what is the indefinite integral of the function e to the power a of x. Well, for the special case that a is 1, things are easy, because then the function is e to the power of x and its antiderivative is also e to the power of x. However, if a is different from 1, we have to take care of a. We do this by putting the factor 1 over a in front. Again, we can easily verify this by differentiating. And again, a must not be equal to 0. The next antiderivative we want to find is the antiderivative of a to the power of x. To understand this, we need some extra calculation. In this calculation, we want to find the derivative of a to the power of x. The trick is to rewrite f of x as a to the power of ln a to the power of x. By using one of the power rules, this is equal to e to the power of x times ln a. Now we can apply the chain rule for differentiating, which gives 
ln a times e to the power of x ln a. And now we rewrite the second factor as a to the power of x and we get ln a times a to the power of x. Using this it is simple to see that the antiderivative of a to the power of x is 1 over ln a times a to the power of x. And again we have to exclude all values of a where this expression is not defined. Finally, the antiderivative of sine of x is negative cosine of x and the antiderivative of cosine of x is sine of x. It is essential to know and to remember the integrals which we have discussed here because later we will calculate integrals of more complex functions using rules which will try to reduce the integrals of the more complex functions to integrals to these elementary functions. Two of these rules we want to state here. The first one allows us to pull a fixed constant a, which is a factor of the function we want to integrate, in front of the integral symbol. That means we can do the integration without this factor and afterwards multiply the result with this factor a. The second rule gives us a very helpful simplification if we want to integrate the sum of two functions. Because in this case we can split up that function and integrate the two summons separately. Afterwards we have to sum up the two results. Now the combination of these two rules gives us a very important rule of how to deal with linear combinations of functions. A linear combination of the functions f1 to fn is generally given by this expression. If we have to integrate such an expression we can split this up heavily. And afterwards for each of these split up integrals we can pull the respective constant in front of the integral symbol. So all what remains to integrate is the different functions f1, f2, f3 until fn. Let's now have a look at some examples. We start with a simple polynomial. Here we can split up the integral in different smaller integrals according to the rules we have just explained. First we split up the sum of the three expressions and obtain the sum of the integrals of each of these expressions. In the second step we pull the constant factors in front of the integrals, which gives this expression. Now we can apply our previously discussed rule of how to integrate powers of x. Observe that we have created three different constants c, c1, c2 and c3. If we now expand the brackets and combine similar expressions we get this the three last summons are summons which are based on the constants c1, c2 and c3. We can combine them and redefine them as one single constant c. Now we are done calculating the indefinite integral of our example function. Let's do another one. Again in the first step we split up the sum, that is the difference in this case. And this is, once more, followed by pulling the constants in front of the integral signs. Now there are two elementary integrals left, the integral of 1 over x and the integral of e to the power of negative 4x. As we have discussed previously, the antiderivative of the first one is ln of the absolute value of x and the integral of the second one is negative 1 over 4 times e to the power of negative 4x. Putting this together and simplifying the constant c's as we did before, we obtain this. As always, we can verify our calculations by differentiating the result and checking if we receive the original function in the integral. So that was a quick story about indefinite integrals. In our next video we will look at so-called definite integrals and show that they are very closely related to area functions under given curves. So thanks for watching and see you next time.